Welcome to the rules for the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is a simulation of the events of 1962 surrounding Operation Anadir, where the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev uh, tried to deploy SS-4 and SS-5 medium-range ballistic and intermediate-range ballistic missiles on Cuba to uh, circumvent the fact that uh, Russia did not have uh, a large number of intercontinental ballistic missiles or a reliable bomber force uh, that could provide deterrence against uh, American actions. So just to give a bit of a, a background uh, to, the, uh, to the crisis, um, uh, between 1952 and 1960, the American president, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, had a policy of, policy of massive retaliation, uh, which was to use uh, America's nuclear arsenal to stop the Soviets if they were to uh, engage in uh, expansion. But this was not a very credible policy, and so Kennedy evolved... Uh, a flexible response strategy, which was to um, make sure that the nuclear retaliation was proportional uh, to the threat. Uh, to that end, the uh, Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, designed a second strike uh, arsenal plan that could kill 25 to 30 percent of the Soviet population and destroy two-thirds of its industrial capacity. At the time, uh, the Soviet Union had uh, very few intercontinental ballistic missiles and was not likely to be able to get uh, many of its bombers uh, into uh, North America. And so there was uh, uh, intense pressure on the Russian part to try to circumvent uh, that weakness. Now, Kennedy had campaigned for president uh, on the basis of the existence of a missile gap, the, the, the idea that the Soviets were getting ahead. Even though he privately knew this was not true, the U.S. was way ahead in ICBMs and way ahead in bombers. On June uh, 3rd and 4th, 1961, uh, the Soviet leader Khrushchev met Kennedy in Vienna, and he generally judged him uh, to be weak, in, in part uh, because Kennedy allowed the uh, Cuban Revolution to, to consolidate itself, uh, because Kennedy backed down during the 1961 Berlin crisis when there was a wall set up by the East Germans and uh, the U.S. Uh, did nothing. And, and finally, the Bay of Pigs invasion, which Cuban exiles failed on a April 15th to the 20th, 1961, to make any inroads uh, into uh, Cuba. So here you can see the uh, grand strategic situation. You have uh, the Soviet Union on one side of the pole and the United States on the other. And uh, American ICBMs uh, would be able to reach uh, over the North Pole and strike at urban areas uh, within the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union did not have a capacity beyond uh, uh, dropping nuclear uh, bombs and firing missiles on Europe. So there's an asymmetric uh, advantage uh, for the U.S. So the Russian goal was to deploy, um, you can see here over here, was to deploy uh, missiles that could um, uh, fire uh, from Cuba. These would be much shorter-range missiles, but to deploy them there was going to be technically difficult because it would have had to have been a, a covert operation. Otherwise, the U.S. would have blocked it. So Khrushchev um, uh, had a plan, therefore, for 36 IRBMs, SS4, uh, SS-5s, and MRBMs, SS-4s, to be deployed uh, into Cuba. Fidel Castro, the uh, recent communist leader, supported uh, this operation, uh, Operation Anadir, and it would have put about 80 million Americans within reach of those uh, nuclear uh, missiles. So here you can see the uh, rapid change of military balance between 1961 and 1964. By 1970, the Soviets ha would have a thousand ICBMs uh, targeted uh, at the uh, U.S., or rather a thousand warheads, but at the time the, uh, of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviets had just a few and uh, where the numbers indicate that there were a few ICBMs that could reach the U.S., Nikita Khrushchev, the uh, Soviet leader, is reputed to have told his son during the crisis that Russia had basically nothing uh, in terms of missiles that could reach uh, the U.S., where the U.S. is a significant advantage, almost a 10 to 1 advantage in terms of bombers, and it has a, a significant advantage in warheads uh, fired by uh, ICBMs. Uh, here you can see the equivalent uh, megatonnage, uh, which is significantly lower uh, for the Russians than it is the Americans. Um, the American total uh, deliverable equivalent, equivalent megatonnage is 655, which is uh, um, a huge amount. 
uh, for that time. This is the uh, surveillance system uh, that primarily looked towards the Arctic, which is where Soviet bombers and missiles were expected to come from, uh, notwithstanding some of the radar coverages depicted here. Deploying missiles on Cuba uh, would have given uh, the Russians a significant advantage because it would have circumvented this uh, surveillance network. And here you can see one of the many that were located in uh, Greenland and uh, Canada's Arctic and Alaska. Uh, here you can see Kennedy uh, conferring with uh, Dwight Eisenhower at the handover. And one of the major issues was the vulnerability of West Berlin, uh, NATO territory deep within East Germany, which was behind the Iron Curtain and therefore vulnerable to being cut off and uh, taken over. And uh, you can see in the bottom uh, left corner the American garrison in Berlin. And this is the Cuban Revolution. Uh, you can see Fidel Castro on the extreme left. And third from the left, you, see, you can see Che Guevara. And this was allowed to consolidate. Um, and Kennedy was blamed for not intervening more aggressively to stop uh, the, that event. This is the uh, Bay of Pigs which ultimately failed as the uh, Cuban exiles who tried to overthrow the communist regime uh, were defeated by uh, a quick response by the Cuban military. And this, of course, is the Berlin crisis, where the wall was built to stop the emigration from East Germany, particularly of skilled labor, uh, to West uh, Germany. And here's the Vienna meeting between Khrushchev and Kennedy, where uh, Khrushchev promised Kennedy that he would not deploy missiles in Cuba. So these are some of the systems that were available at the time to both sides. The Americans have uh, the Atlas, and they were just at that time deploying, deploying the Polaris. You can see in the center of the screen the SS-4 and the SS-5. And on the right side, you can see the three ICBMs and other um, medium-range missiles that would have been pointed, pointing at Europe. So you can see in the chart for 1959, the Russians had some ICBMs, um, and the Americans uh, had none. Uh, but by 1962, the Russians had 75, but there's a big question mark as to how many of them uh, were functioning. And the Soviets had some sea-launched ballistic missiles, and the Americans had 144. So the Americans had a, had a strategic lead uh, for a time. So, uh, with Fidel Castro's approval, um, Operation Anadir uh, was, was set off. Uh, in, in the simulation, Castro is represented by a piece uh, which uh, can be turned over, so it's it's not clear where it is. It can be concealed, and victory points are given to the Americans if they manage to capture that, capture that, capture that piece. So to give the bit of the timeline on the operation, on July 26, 1962, you have the first Russian ship arriving in Cuba with missiles. There are 85 ships, which did 184 trips. On September 12th, Kennedy publicly op opposes an invasion of Cuba. Uh, he was uh, facing a very aggressive Republican uh, Congress. On September 13th, Kennedy warns the Soviet Union against uh, any offensive buildup in Cuba. And then on October 14th, on Sunday, a U-2 aircraft provided the first footage of uh, missile facilities. And there's, a, there's a, a, um, an excellent book by Graham Allison called The Essence of Decision, which looks at all of the micro-bureaucratic infighting uh, that uh, uh, plagued the U.S. decision-making process. Uh, just to show you how complex uh, decision-making is in, in a country as large as the U.S. And uh, that U-2 flight was uh, essentially the function of a CIA Air Force dispute over which was better qualified to fly the aircraft. So the, the aircraft could have flown 10 days earlier. So here are some of the ships. This is the uh, SS-4, the medium-range ballistic missile. This is the SS-5. Uh, during the uh, crisis, the SS-5 was never operational, and the pressure on Kennedy was to resolve the crisis before this missile became operational and then provided uh, a deterrent effect against changing the status of the missile arsenal in uh, Cuba. Most of these missiles and their parts were still en route on ships during the crisis, and some of them may have been uh, quarantined. You can see here the range of the SS-4 and the SS-5. The SS-4 is the shorter orange range, and the SS-5 is the longer range, and the number of people that are brought uh, in the uh, east coast of North America under the effects of a uh, possible uh, nuclear attack. So this is the setup of the game, and it just shows you in the... Uh, th this is not 
quite historical, but it's approximate. The missiles were set up in the north of Cuba so that it could maximize the coverage. So let's sort of zoom in a little bit closer. Here you can see the SS-4 and the SS-5s. The SS-4s and SS-5s are immobile. They cannot be relocated. They're, uh, they have uh, static uh, launching systems. The SS-5 uh, begins uh, the simulation not necessarily ready uh, to, be, uh, to be launched. Uh, and that depends on factors that we'll discuss later, but essentially how many Soviet troops there are in Cuba and how much warning uh, they give the U.S. by having such a large deployment. You can also see here uh, in red the uh, coastal defense missile, and you can see SAT, SA-2s, which are very important. They're the surface-to-air missiles that keep the U.S. aircraft uh, from doing reconnaissance and doing airstrikes against the, um, against the missile sites. So this is the U-2 aircraft. Uh, that was sent over uh, Cuba uh, to do photo reconnaissance, and this is the path on uh, 14th of October, and there are uh, flights uh, before and flights after showing the difference. Uh, the flights over Cuba had an increased uh, intensity and frequency because a U-2 had been shot down in China, and so the force was redirected uh, into the Caribbean. This here is a useful chart for the player responsible for the U-2 flights, the CIA, and uh, it basically, in the rules, you're required to fly a, a straight column of hexes. And so these are various possible straight uh, columns of hexes. Um, and it gives you the, the uh, number of terrestrial hexes that are crossed over. And you can use this to calculate what the optimal path is. But it's, they're also predictable paths, and so the aircraft could get shot down as a consequence. Uh, and just to, just to see here, there's there are six SS4 sites and three SS5 sites, as as defined in the uh, the size units of the uh, of the game. So this is the uh, original October 14th uh, shot of the uh, site at San Cristobal. This is a, a closer view of the uh, San Cristobal site. This is a. Uh, Another view of the San Cristobal site, the MRBM launching, the SS-4 launching site. Here's another site. This looks more like a low-level reconnaissance that would have been done later, not by the U-2. Uh, these are later shots of different sites. This is 27th October. This is the uh, 1st of November. And here you can see another uh, site in the difficult terrain uh, that the U-2 was trying to detect uh, the the targets within. So this is a um, publicity map from the military of the Soviet buildup. You can see most of the missiles are to the uh, east of the island to maximize their range over uh, the U.S. This is a, a map also used during the crisis, showing where the lo where the missiles were located. This here is actually Kennedy's map of the crisis, uh, showing uh, how he kept track of the uh, process. So on October 16th, Tuesday, Kennedy was told that the missiles were detected on Cuba. Canada, uh, Kennedy uh, summoned the uh, Executive Committee of the National Security Council, XCOM, and uh, they met 11.15 a.m. on October 16th to discuss the crisis. The meetings were recorded, um, and it, it's really the focus of a lot of study uh, how that committee managed to come out with a solution that avoided uh, an escalation of the crisis to nuclear war. So it's an interesting uh, case. On October 22nd, uh, President Kennedy announced that missiles were detected on Cuba publicly and he began invasion preparations. On October 23rd, a day later, he put a quarantine around Cuba. And the high point of the crisis was October 24th to the, uh, to the 29th. So um, this is the, uh, the speech that he gave on that day on October 22nd. And... Here we can see the executive uh, committee, and there are quite a few members on the committee. Uh, it had 15 members, uh, President Kennedy himself, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, Secretary of the Treasury Douglas Dillon, White House Foreign Policy Coordinator McGeorge Bundy, uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, his brother, uh, President's brother, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff General Maxwell Taylor, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, White House Staff Members uh, Theodore Sorensen, Chief of the CIA John McCone, and then Paul Nitze, George Ball, and Llewellyn Thompson. Um, ultimately, Kennedy wanted to mitigate the short decision time that he thought was the cause of the First World War, and so he were, was looking for policy options that would widen the amount of time available for uh, the Americans to consider their options, and then to use that time to gradually compel 
uh, Nikita Khrushchev to submit to their to their goal. And there are a number of different choices: those that do nothing, those that use diplomatic pressure, secret discussions with Castro, which is largely uh, ruled out. Um, uh, and ultimately, the uh, the focus came down on on airstrike and blockade. That was the essential uh, focus uh, of of their decisions, uh, because of the low probability of a uh, an airstrike, ultimately the, the selection was made for a blockade with the threat of invasion, uh, knowing that um, if the U.S. invaded Cuba, it was very likely the Soviets would move against West Berlin and then the conflict would escalate uh, in Europe. So that was always a, a serious consideration uh, for the American leadership. Here you can see the executive committee. There's Robert McNamara. Uh, there's uh, Robert Kennedy in the middle, and there's Sorensen on the right. Uh, here is George Bundy and... Uh, I think that's uh, Dean Atkinson or Nitzi, I can't tell, can't remember which. Uh, here's the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff conferring with uh, Kennedy, including the uh, commander of uh, Strategic Air Command, uh, Curtis LeMay, uh, who's the uh, uniformed uh, individual on the uh, far right. Uh, here's um, an earlier picture of Vice President Richard Nixon uh, meeting with Fidel Castro uh, in uh, New York. Uh, and so it showed that there were there were still um, considerations of a direct appeal to Castro, but it was believed that Castro had very little influence over the Russians, and so that was really uh, pointless. And plus, he was somewhat paranoid. So in the simulation, there are different positions that are um, to which students are assigned. These positions vary in number. This is really the maximalist number of of players. There's players on the American American side, and then the Russian side, and the players on the American side are divided between those in the, um, the executive committee and those in the Pentagon. All of the members of the Pentagon can confer only with the Secretary of Defense. So the Secretary of Defense has a big responsibility translating information coming from the operational side of the plan. So the American president ultimately decides uh, which of the policy options to take, and different players have different policy options they're responsible for, and these policy options are represented as cards, and I'll show you the cards in a moment. Uh, the director of the CIA uh, has the cards that deal with the uh, increased reconnaissance, Operation Mongoose, uh, which is um, a, uh, an espionage and uh, essentially an insurgency operation in Cuba itself. The Secretary of Defense can mobilize the U.S. Army, uh, retaliate against SAMs, mobilize NATO, uh, impose a naval quarantine, uh, uh, conduct a surgical strike, initiate nuclear war, attack the Warsaw Pact, attack Soviet submarines, invade Cuba, and airstrikes, uh, conduct airstrikes on Cuba. The National Security Advisor um, has freedom. Um, uh, uh, their responsibility is the American random events table that we'll look at later on, but essentially they should carry the rule book um, uh, because there's very little time to make decisions in these simulations, and uh, they're there to advise the president, sort of a second head. Now, in the U.S. military, uh, you've got uh, Strategic Air Command. Uh, they use the nukes. Uh, they uh, have to wait until they get uh, permission from the Initiate Nuclear War card, but something it, because it's a complex process, they should always be calculating how to conduct the nuclear war. Uh, there's the... Um, uh, the U.S. Air Force, and that's a complex task because there's a lot of airplanes with lots of different tasks. Some are nuclear, some are not. Some are low-level reconnaissance, some are not. Uh, then there's the Navy and the Marines uh, and the ships. They're responsible for conducting the quarantine, conducting air operations off of carriers. There's the U.S. Army, uh, of which there's the a ground component that comes through captured ports. There are Marines. Uh, there are um, uh, heli-borne forces. So, that, again, a very complex task. Uh, and this is why all of this has to be um, translated into political sense by the Secretary of Defense to the to the President. Um, the 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 Secretary of Defense also doubles as the uh, NATO commander, and so they roll on the war in Turkey and the war in Europe table. Uh, should that happen, uh, the Soviet and Cuban positions are are broken up uh, into those uh, located in the Soviet Union and those located into Cuba. Once the quarantine goes into effect. There may be no communications between those in Cuba and those in, in the Soviet Union. And, uh, and if any cards are played, policy cards are played, those in Cuba have precedence over those in uh, the Soviet Union. 
So in the Soviet Union, you have the, you have the Soviet leader, the Secretary General, you've got the Defense Minister. Through the, def the Defense Minister uh, is, is communicated all of the uh, information from the, um, uh, the Soviet military, both in the Soviet Union and in Cuba. The Russian ambassador has a special role. Um, uh, he or she may communicate directly with Robert Kennedy, uh, who is uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, brother. And uh, uh, so there's a special channel uh, that, that was uh, in effect uh, during the crisis. In the Soviet Union, you have the commander of the Strategic Rocket Forces, basically the counterpart to the American Strategic uh, Air Command leader. Uh, they've got a deputy, there's the uh, Warsaw Pact commander and the Russian Navy commander. They choose uh, what ships go in a convoy, and they also roll on the European war table or the invasion of Turkey table. So for the Russians in Cuba, you've got the Russian army itself, you've got the Russian tactical army, which has uh, tactical nuclear weapons, the, the Luna rockets. You've got the uh, first deputy Russian army, which is the, um, the deputy. Uh, you've got the Air Force commander, and then you've got the Air Defense commander. The Air Defense commander's got a big job uh, putting down all the SA-2s and effectively conducting all of the roles and all of the choices as American aircraft fly into Cuba. So it's a big job. So for the Cubans, you've got Fidel Castro, who uh, basically tells all the other Cubans what to do. You've got a small Cuban Air Force, the uh, Cuban Defense Minister, who uh, commands the Army, and then you've got uh, a West, Central, and East commander for the uh, Cuban Army, and they... They uh, you know, effectively are responsible for, de for deploying the different um, ground units, of which there are quite a few. So this is the map. It's uh, broken down into uh, hexagon hexagonal spaces. Uh, you can see the d the depiction of ground in Cuba. The light brown is forest. Sorry, the light the light green is is plains. The dark green is forest. Uh, the brown are mountains. Uh, big squares are the two large cities of, of Havana and Santiago de Cuba. The small round black dots are, are towns. Uh, red arrows indicate beaches that can be landed at. Uh, anchors are ports. Thick red lines are highways. Thin red lines are uh, secondary roads. Uh, and you can see uh, Guantanamo Bay in the bottom uh, right-hand uh, corner of the map. In the top right-hand corner, you've got um, uh, uh, um, f four airfields that are in Florida, Florida and thereabouts, an at-sea box, and a general port indicator for the... Uh, U.S. and the top of the map, you've got additional movement points that must be paid for from Key West for helicopter units that would be flying in from Key West to land in uh, Cuba. On the, le on the left, in the middle, you've got a game turn track, which is dated. This is where the convoys are going to go through. In the middle, you've got a political opinion track, which goes from minus 13 to plus 13. It's for the different political targets that the Russians and Americans will be appealing to. Below that, you've got two aircraft carriers which hold uh, air units. You've got the uh, map legend on the uh, bottom left. Uh, next to it, you've got the counter legend, which uh, shows the strength of the uh, ground, air, and missile units. So you can see the numbers there. The ground units have a ground combat value. Then they've got a movement value, and it indicates whether they're air transportable and their rough size. For the air units, you've got an air value on top, a, a general combat a ground combat on the bottom, and you've got a red indicator if they can drop nuclear weapons, and then you've got a missile unit, which uh, indicates their uh, nuclear strength, um, and of course they're automatically nuclear capable. You've then got a list of unit types, unit sizes, and then an air transport track, which is reset to 10 at the beginning of every turn, basically indicating how many American units can be moved by aircraft, whether airlifting or parachuting. So this is the, the game map. Uh, you can see here the sequence of play. So this game is played uh, essentially quite simply. You have the Americans who play through a sequence, then the Russians play through a sequence, and then the turn counter is advanced to the next day. So the uh, first turn is special because the only thing that happens on the first turn is the flying of a U-2 aircraft over Cuba. And if a detection is made, then the Americans will initiate uh, the rest of their actions. But essentially, the game is frozen until the U-2 makes a detection of either a, uh, uh, an SS-4 or an SS-5. So the, in sequence of play, the first step is the uh, air rec recovery phase. All of the aircraft that the Americans had flying around in the previous turn are returned to their uh, bases. The American air transport total goes back up to 10. because They, they used some on the previous turn. The Americans have to roll for accidents, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. These are sort of random events. Um, and then uh, the, the player can change their alert status. 
And the Americans have DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 1, where DEFCON 5 is safe and DEFCON 1 is uh, free to initiate nuclear war. And it's very important because different policies have limits. They have numbers on the cards which indicate what DEFCON must be present in order to play that card. So there is some incentive to push the DEFCON up. The problem is if the, if the DEFCON is too high, clearly uh, the two sides are signaling each other that they're ready for uh, nuclear war. It's going to be dangerous. Um, a country can increase or decrease its alert status by one uh, in any turn. Uh, so it doesn't go down completely in, in any turn. You have to be careful. And, or you can match the alert status of the opponent. Uh, the Russian alert status is peace, crisis, or war. It's a three-level system where the Americans have a five-level system. And then the players can play a single card. The American chooses which card to play based on the advice of the uh, executive committee. Uh, it's the same with the, uh, the Russian leader. So you can either play a card, or you can remove one card, or you can do nothing, in effect. And sometimes uh, a random event that you roll will force you to play one card or another. Uh, this is also the time that you uh, withdraw units. You can, uh, the Americans can withdraw their unit from Guantanamo. The Russians can withdraw their missiles. The Americans can withdraw their Jupiter missiles from Turkey. And convoys, ships can be uh, turned around. The next step is the off-board conflicts phase, uh, in which you roll two, two dice to see how the war is going in Europe or Turkey. And this depends on whether the war has been uh, broken out there. And that's, that's one of the policy cards. Next is the uh, strategic movement phase. Now, in, in the strategic movement phase, and every other phase thereafter, at any time, uh, either side can initiate nuclear war uh, or an airstrike if they've already played the policy card for it. So it's really flexible type of uh, intervention. So during the strategic movement phase, uh, units are moved by sea and air, and airborne amphibious operations are conducted, and the Soviet player would conduct their uh, convoy operations. Then there's the movement phase in which ground units move, um, and then there's the combat phase in which combat is resolved. So you would go through the sequence one for the American player, and then you would go again uh, through it uh, for the uh, Soviet player. It's essentially the sequence. So this is the uh, random events uh, chart. Uh, you would have, for example, a, um, a, a nuclear test, and this has an, a political effect. The USSR political indicator has moved to minus one. This shows the... the, the the, the Soviets are, are uh, they, in fact, they get a bonus from conducting the, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, this is the American random events table. So the Soviets would move towards minus one. In general, um, minus movements on the political chart indicate uh, public support for the Soviet position, and positive movements move towards support for the American position. And so victory points depend largely on the accumulation of these points. Uh, political um, plus uh, losses that are incurred in a nuclear war, plus uh, gaining and capturing of cities, capturing of uh, cities in Europe in general war, and uh, capturing Fidel Castro. So in general, you should, it's, it's important to be very sensitive to uh, the policy choices. So here you have military exercises. There's an incident that could occur. A uh, Soviet cargo ship could get sunk, and hardliners could have increased influence within the uh, U.S. government. Uh, Curtis LeMay really did not think much of Kennedy. He thought he was a child, or childlike. Uh, he had witnessed the Japanese surprise attack of the U.S. B-17 force in northern, northern Luzon, Philippines in World War II, and so he was very aggressive, and he squirreled away eight nuclear warheads from the Department of Energy uh, abroad uh, so that in the event of a failure of American uh, uh, political leadership, he could conduct his own nuclear war against the uh, Soviet Union. So here's the uh, communist random events table. It, it's basically um, symmetrical to the American table. It also includes incidents and, and hardliner influences in the uh, Soviet Politburo. Uh, one of the incidents is a, a submarine um, uh, incident with the, uh, uh, in which one enters the, uh, uh, enters the U.S. water and it forces the Americans, uh, forces the Soviets to play a card in which uh, submarines are advanced uh, to the uh, U.S. littoral. Here's uh, members of the uh, Soviet uh, uh, Politburo voting. Actually, it looks more like the Presidium. So here's some of the cards. Uh, you can see, looking at the top left, as an example of one card, three indicates the uh, DEFCON level. So you'd, you, this, this would have occurred probably by turn three, or turn two. You would have gone from DEFCON 1 to DEFCON, or rather DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 4, then DEFCON 4 to DEFCON 3. So it would, take, it would have taken two turns. Retaliation. U.S. air units may conduct uh, ground attacks against Soviets that have fired on them. Now, it should qualify some of these cards are nested. 
and they depend on previous card plays. If the American player wants to invade Cuba, they must have already played the Airstrike Cuba policy and the Mobilize the U.S. Army policy. If the Americans want to airstrike Cuba, they must already have played the surgical strike against MRBMs and IRBMs card. Uh, if the Americans want to attack the Warsaw Pact, they must have already mobilized NATO. Uh, and uh, if they want to engage in Operation Mongoose, uh, they must do it before the Cubans mobilize their army. Now, a lot of these are sort of self-evidence once you have an overview of all of the cards, but they're not written on the individual cards themselves. Now, below, uh, uh, at the bottom of the card, you'll see different... Uh, uh, political groups, uh, Cuba, NATO, the OAS, Organization of American States, the UN, USSR, USA, and USSR, and the political effect it has on um, where those uh, where, where the markers go for how much those different entities support the American or the Russian position. Now, so you can see here the surgical strike, naval quarantine, mobilized NATO, low-level reconnaissance, which allows you to spot uh, non-moving units, uh, airstrikes on Cuba, which you can't do it until you play this card, invade Cuba, attack Soviet submarines, specifically the submarines that have nuclear missiles off the U.S. coast. This is very dangerous, but it's, it's um, the Americans had a good ASW, anti-submarine warfare at the time. Attack the Warsaw, initiate nuclear war. You can see that's DEFCON 1. So these are the different political entities that are uh, appealed to. Uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Cuba, Organization of American States, etc., uh, so at the end of the game, uh, victory points are awarded for every uh, value in the direction of the player. So for the Soviets, it's in the negative direction. For the Americans, uh, it's in the positive direction. So if the Americans have a, a plus five with NATO, uh, they get five victory points per point. It's five times five is 25 victory points at the end. And so these are calculated into the um, total victory points at the end of the game. Uh, it should be pointed out that to, to win a game, you must have more victory points than the, than the opponent. There's actually a multiplier table that's got to be examined at the end to compare Russian and, and American values. And you must avoid getting negative values. And if a nuclear war breaks out, it's very likely both sides will have negative values, and therefore both sides will lose. So, you know, one of the options is to uh, bomb the uh, MRBMs and the IRBMs, or to bomb the SAM sites that are shooting at you, or to bomb the, uh, the Cuban military in general. So this is the uh, quarantine option, uh, basically closing um, the passage of ships. Now, once this is done, the Soviets have ships coming in, possibly with the remaining parts for the SS-5 missiles, and these can be intercepted, and the Americans can choose a level of aggress aggressivity they want in intercepting these ships. Um, the Americans can also chase uh, down the submarines that, are, uh, that have the um, ballistic missiles uh, in them. So here you can see withdraw missiles from Turkey, pledge not to invade Cuba, and economic blockade of Cuba, return Guantanamo naval base to Cuba, Operation Mongoose, uh, which basically makes the Cuban army disorganized. So it gives the Americans a military advantage if they want to invade Cuba. Increased reconnaissance, which allows them to fly two U-2s per turn, not one. Uh, present the case of the United Nations, boycott the United Nations, present the case of the Organization of American States, and mobilize the U.S. Army. This is a, a Jupiter missile, like the one deployed in Turkey, and that's where it's deployed in Turkey, and the Americans ultimately use this as one of the bargaining chips um, for the, uh, the Soviets in order to get the missiles out of Cuba. Uh, the Americans also appealed to the United Nations. Here they presented um, maps of the Soviet missiles in Cuba to the uh, um, Security Council. And the Americans also appeal to the Organization of American States. Here you can see Kennedy in the middle with the members of the different states in North America. This is the, um, the Secretariat and the, where the, where the, uh, the OAS meets. Here's the uh, Council of the OAS, and this is an OAS meeting uh, itself. And the OAS ultimately supported the American position against Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So these are the Russian cards. You've got air alert, deploy submarines off the U.S. seaboard, surprise attacks, attack in Guantanamo Bay, uh, airstrike on Turkey, invade Turkey, invade Germany, capture Berlin, initiate nuclear war. Uh, for the Soviets to use their ballistic missiles against the U.S., they have to deploy their submarines off the U.S. seaboard. Uh, this is a, uh, a Soviet, um, an American estimate of a Soviet plan to invade western, uh, rather eastern Turkey to get to the uh, Suez Canal. Uh, there's one option for the uh, Soviet player to use the Aleutian 28 Beagle bombers in a surprise attack against either a one U.S. base in Florida or against a U.S. aircraft carrier. Uh, otherwise, these aircraft um, are available for play. There's a number of them from the Russian Air Force deployed um, in Cuba during the game. Uh, they, the Soviets may invade uh, uh, West Germany if they want and start a general war. 
Um, they can seize Berlin. This is uh, during the Berlin Crisis of 1961. Uh, these are other cards. Uh, they can withdraw missiles from Cuba, withdraw bombers from Cuba, withdraw troops from Cuba, withdraw the SAM sites from Cuba. They can return the convoys, basically turn them around. Uh, they can uh, present the case to the United Nations, boycott the United Nations, mobilize the Cuban army, mobilize the Warsaw Pact, and blockade Berlin. They need to mobilize the Warsaw Pact if they're going to invade uh, NATO or Turkey. So this is the war in uh, Europe table. Uh, both players roll two dice in their turn, and they uh, accumulate the modifiers that are on the right and, and total them up uh, over time. And... Uh, you can see the outcomes in Europe and uh, Turkey are far more important than the outcomes in Cuba itself. But it just shows you how um, an event like Cuba could escalate to have much bigger implications for a country's security. So here's the war in Turkey table. It's resolved the same way, and you have you accumulate the diral modifiers turn for turn, and you can capture cities like Istanbul can be captured, and that gives victory points to the um, Soviet side. So this is the convoy table that was mentioned earlier. Uh, the SS-5s that are depicted here as visible would normally be turned over and they would look like cargo ships. And the uh, Americans, um, uh, once they declare quarantine, can search these ships and they can search them with levels, different levels of, of um, assertiveness. And the more assertive the Americans are, the more likely it is that the cargo ships will be sunk and this will lead to an international incident. So there's a, a, um, a lot of incentives for the Americans to be quite restrained. Furthermore, the Russians can um, get submarines through to the quarantine, and then they can, uh, if, if some of those uh, cargo ships are turned over and their um, uh, uh, submarines, these submarines can be, can be used as escorts of the cargo ships, and then they add to the, um, uh, the probability of an incident occurring. Uh, you can also see here the marker for M-Day, which is Mobilization Day for the U.S. Army and Marines. You can see Operation Mongoose. Uh, and uh, it's unknown uh, to the American player when the Russian SS-5s will be ready. So here is the, you can see the, the chart. The Americans can choose between passive, cautious, and bold. And while it increases the probability of them checking the ship, and if they, if they find a ship that has missiles, then there's a bonus for the Americans. But otherwise... Uh, if the ship is sunk, there's a bonus for the Russians. So it's a, a fairly high-risk table to uh, appeal to. Here you can see the blockade in effect, of quarantine rather. The Americans can also airstrike, of course. Um, and they'd be facing uh, MiG-21 or MiG-19 aircraft uh, of the Soviet Air Force that were deployed in Cuba at the time. Uh, there's also an invasion that's possible. Um, this is uh, one depiction of the invasion. Um, if the American ba troops basically landing on one of the red arrows, which indicates a, um, a beach. Uh, here is one uh, depiction of an invasion. You can see here in green the American 82nd and 101st. Those are airborne troops. They'd be brought in by air transport. And you can see the Marines with anchors that are capturing uh, beaches and they're landing uh, against Cuban forces. Many of the units are turned over because until you're next to a unit, it's unknown what that unit is unless you do uh, air reconnaissance. You can also do airborne operations landing on a beach. Uh, here is uh, several turns later where the Americans have consolidated control of western Cuba and the Marines and the Army have come through the ports and they're pushing up against the missiles in central Cuba. I'd, I'd expect them to take it in a turn or so. The Americans have a missile as well. It's the uh, Pershing. It's deployed in Florida, but they can deploy it on Cuba if they want to. And it's got four steps and the Americans can use it to nuke tactically uh, Cuban or Soviet forces on the ground. The Soviets, during the crisis, also had Luna missiles, which are uh, later FROG missile, free rocket over ground, number sevens, and these uh, can be used to be fired at the Americans. And one of the uh, Soviet players is responsible just for these systems. So this is a terrain effects chart. In effect, the, um, uh, it's for, to move a unit across the map, that unit must pay um, that number of movement points from its movement point total. Um, and uh, when it engages in combat, if it attacks uh, into a hex like Ruff or Mountain or a city or a major city uh, or Guantanamo itself, there are either shifts that, are, that um, worsen the situation or there are die roll modifiers that worsen the situation for the attacker. So definitely it's an advantage to defend in large cities or cities or Ruff's, Ruff Mountain and uh, Guantanamo Bay itself. And the combat results table are fairly simple, standard combat tables, it's uh, a ratio between the attacker's attack value and the defender's uh, strength value, and you round down in favor of the defender, and then you roll a 1d6, apply the modifiers, and then there are six, uh, there are other four possible um, outcomes, rather five possible outcomes, 
AE is attacker eliminated, DE is defender eliminated, uh, exchange is decide what the lower number of strength points are eliminated, and the other must uh, eliminate uh, at least as many uh, points. Uh, and if they have a unit that's too high denomination, then they're going to lose more than they have to. And AR is attacker retreat, they have to go back one hex, and DR is defender retreat, they have to retreat back uh, one hex. So this is the uh, the Russian deployment choice. The Russians can deploy all of their forces, um, and it, you have to consult the rules to see how the points are calculated, but here you can see the points um, indicated. The more forces are deployed, the more likely the Americans are to detect the deployment, and a higher probability that the missiles will not be ready. So once you calculate the point values, and you consult this chart, um, you apply the points to the uh, top column, and you roll. And the number, rather the date that's indicated, uh, um, uh, you roll a 2d6, tells you when the SS5s will be ready. So in some cases, if you have 241 Soviet forces and you roll a 12, the missiles won't be ready until November 9th. So there's an incentive to minimize the Soviet deployment, to maximize the covertness of the operation. Now the Cuban military's forces in the game are much higher than, than what I allow the Cubans to deploy. I use the uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies um, military balance of 1962 to estimate how many forces they had, and I confirm that with other sources. So this is what they can deploy uh, on the map. So this is what a deployment would look like. You can see uh, American airplanes deployed at the air bases uh, in the top right. Each of those air units has a, a designator for what squadron it's in, and each of those airfields has a squadron identifier. Uh, if you look at the uh, bottom left, you'll see uh, two aircraft carriers with their air units. Uh, in the middle, you'll see a number of victory points for different captured cities, and you'll see all of the different groupings, the Soviet Union, Cuba, the OAS, NATO, the UN, and the US in the middle of the chart. And in the middle left, you'll see the convoys. Uh, you basically take every ship, and you roll uh, 2d6, and you go that many spaces from October 16th, um, or rather October 14th into the future, and... Uh, uh, and you, you, you essentially uh, randomly distribute all of the ships. Uh, some of them are normal cargo ships, some of them are submarines, some of them are carrying uh, SS-5 missile parts. Uh, so here you can see uh, a sort of a closer, a closer indication of some of the pieces. These pieces would not normally be visible, they'd be turned over so they'd be invisible, but the units with the double X on top, those indicate divisions of 15,000 soldiers, they are visible. Uh, those two red pieces are uh, shore-based um, cruise missile defenses. Uh, here you can see uh, parts of the Cuban uh, military, actually 1961. Here you can see that shore-based uh, cruise missile defense system. This is an SA-2, very important. This is the uh, surf terror missile system that was so important and so difficult to crack. Uh, for the U.S. Air Force to defeat this system in the game, you'd have to approach it like peeling an onion. You have a lot of airplanes applied on the outside layer, They'd have to brave through the SA-2 uh, fire, and then they would slowly wear down. Um, the SA-2s have a range of uh, two hexes, their own hex and, and one hex adjacent. They're high altitude, so they can shoot down U-2 aircraft. Uh, obviously, they're better at shooting um, uh, on their own hex than they are at adjacent hexes, uh, and they can hit high, high altitude targets where other air defense systems cannot. Those are indicated in the uh, unit, identifier, unit identifier on the map. The SA-2s... Um, uh, are, are hidden until they fire. Uh, so until a U-2 flies overhead, and at the end of the turn, they're turned back, just like any unit is. Any unit that's next to another unit is visible. Uh, so here you can see historically where the uh, SA-2s were located. Obviously, they're located around the uh, missile systems. This is central Cuba. I've made uh, Fidel Castro visible in this case. You can see uh, where I've got the SA-2s. and There's some missiles down underneath some of those uh, pieces, and I've got the pieces there to protect. Uh, the darker brown pieces are Russian, the lighter brown are uh, Cuban. This is the Cuban air defense. Uh, air defenses like this cannot shoot at high altitude aircraft like U-2s, but they can shoot at all other aircraft. Um, actually, there's a card that has to be played for the Cubans to get permission to start shooting at aircraft that are flying overhead. So that's a part of the whole policy process. Uh, here you can see system, systems in the south. In the, in the very bottom of the map, you can see Guantanamo Bay with a, a U.S. Marine unit that's in gray. And you can see Komar uh, missile boats in red. Here's a Komar firing one of its uh, missiles. This is Guantanamo Bay itself. The Americans landing what looks like an LST, a landing ship tank. Uh, so these are the uh, air bases. M indicates that the air forces have not yet been mobilized. You need to get permission 
to airstrike Cuba before these are activated, and until they are, they're turned over. The U-2 aircraft, however, are available from the beginning, although only one airplane may fly historically. You can see on the bottom one is Anderson. Uh, Anderson was the name of the uh, Air Force pilot who flew the CIA aircraft and was killed. He was shot down uh, by an SA-2 uh, historically, and there you can see him and his uh, U-2 aircraft. So here you can see the center of the map, the political opinion track with the different markers and the different victory points that are obtained for capturing locations. So per Berlin, as you can see, and Paris are very valuable. Uh, the, this is an aircraft carrier. There are two aircraft carriers depicted in the game with aircraft that can do uh, bombing. Many of them are the A-4 Skyhawk. So these are the land-based systems that were in the, uh, in the event. You can see uh, the Sapwood SS-4, the very largest missile in the center. There are only four of them available uh, to uh, the Soviet Union. On the extreme right, you can see the 40 SS-5s. It says 40 in transit, and then the 32 SS-4s. And then you can see the American missiles, the Titan I, the Atlas, the Thor, the Jupiter, uh, the Minuteman missile. So the, the Americans had a, a significant missile advantage. So in, uh, if there was a nuclear exchange, you would use this nuclear arsenal chart. Um, the Americans and Russians have different numbers of ICBMs and IRBMs and SLBMs and bombers. Uh, and it gives you the uh, total victory point value, just for comparison purposes. These missiles can either be fired at cities, or they can be fired with counter value, or they can be counter force used against enemy targets. If you use a counter force, you'd use the chart below. Um, so the uh, the a counter value calculation is a minus one for every hit, and it, it's the equivalent of 100,000 uh, people killed. So this is the uh, counter, force, counter force results uh, table. And so ultimately, um, to get the more nuanced elements of the uh, rules, you're going to have to uh, uh, go through them. They're not too long, but it's got uh, a sort of details on, on things like zones of control and how the units move and how... Um, you calculate how many units can be moved by, uh, uh, by ship. Um, most of the values are fairly simple. Uh, air combat is you simply roll a D6 equal to or below the number on the aircraft, and then if you do, then... You, not, not equal, rather, just simply below. And then you, you destroy whatever target you're trying to fire at. And most of the combat systems are uh, done that way. So um, this is the uh, sort of an outline, a, a bare-bones outline of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis simulation.